from the Tukas Copy TV studio in Geneva. I'm Daniel Schwenger. Alongside me to discuss trends in nonprofit funding and social investment is Dr. Christoph Ben. He is external relations director of the Global Fund here in Geneva. Christoph, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. The Global Fund was started and created in 2002 as a response to the three major pandemics, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and today it is a model example for innovative health funding. So uh, where do we stand uh, in this fight today? We can really say that a lot of progress has been made since the Global Fund was established in 2002. And these days when the whole world is looking at the Ebola crisis in, in West Africa and another infectious disease captures the attention of, of the world and of political leaders, it is probably quite helpful to look back at what happened, you know, 12 years ago when the Global Fund was established. Um, because that was also a response to a global emergency. But already at that time, it was at a completely different scale. Um, if we compare the situation in 2002, um, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, the three major infectious diseases, killed about 6 million people per year. And it was perceived as a global emergency. Um, it was like now Ebola brought to the UN Security Council. Kofi Annan, as the then Secretary General of the UN, uh, organized a big conference of the UN General Assembly on HIV AIDS, the first time ever that that happened. And there was the sense we need to do something dramatically uh, to address these diseases because the situation was um, that many countries were overwhelmed by these infections. We had infection rates of more than 20% in many countries. Um, and, and that's the big difference to the Ebola crisis now, we had effective treatment for all these diseases. Only that, the treatment was unaffordable. It was too expensive for most uh, low-income countries in Africa, but also in Latin America and Asia. And that's when the idea came up, let's create a global fund, a financial instrument, a public-private partnership that can help these countries finance programs against these diseases. So that's how we started. We had the mandate to mobilize significant amounts of money. So we knew we had to mobilize billions of dollars, um, but now, 12 years later, we can say, uh, you know, a lot has been achieved. Uh, the infection rates have indeed come down on all three diseases. Let's start with AIDS because that's the most prominent uh, among those that killed most of the people. Um, you know, mortality from AIDS has gone down by about 33%. Um, and even in the most affected countries, it has gone down significantly. That's a great achievement. Tuberculosis deaths have gone down by 40%. Um, and malaria uh, in Africa alone has gone down by 50%. And many countries are now approaching what we call the pre-elimination phase. So if you get infection rates down by more than 90%, then you can say, OK, can we really eliminate this disease? And that's the case in a number of countries. So um, a lot has happened uh, in, a, in a very positive way. I think it's one of the success stories also for the Millennium Development Goals because it, the Global Fund was created in that context. It was around the millennium that, you know, um, uh, the world was open to innovative approaches. And I think this is one that has really worked. So how does the Ebola crisis now affect the mandate of the Global Fund in Africa, for example? Yeah. I mean, it, it does affect, of course, you know, all organizations working in health in that region. Um, we have to realize differently from AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, which are basically global problems. I mean, when, when AIDS was brought to the Security Council, we had already 23 million infections. We had AIDS in about 190 countries around the world. Ebola is a very, very serious problem. Uh, but it is limited as an epidemic to three countries in West Africa. It's a huge problem there and we have to do everything we can, but fortunately it's much more localized than, than the other infectious diseases. Um, the big challenge with Ebola is that it's spreading quite fast um, and that it has been hitting countries that have fairly weak health systems that are coming out of civil war and, 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 and a diff very difficult period. So for the Global Fund, it means that um, we try to support the countries. We have, of course, programs and financial support, you know, in all these countries. And we, we allow them to use some of our resources as well to reprogram. Because in the end, it's not much difference. Um, 
you know, preventing HIV, for example, you need to take almost the same precautions as you do for, for Ebola. Um, you need to train health uh, workers so that they know about a viral disease and how it spreads. You need to include the communities uh, with education and preventive measures. That's quite similar, actually, to, to HIV. So we are allowing them to use our programs uh, to, to address that. And there is also a very important link um, between malaria and, and Ebola because both diseases cause acute fever and it's very important to differentiate so that, you know, malaria patients really get their malaria treatment and are not sent to Ebola centers, for example, where they then are at high risk to, mm -hmm. to become infected with Ebola. So the Global Fund is also taking part in the Ebola response through like helping uh, capacity uh, to build it up and helping with the infrastructure. So what would you say, what are the uh, success factors and major principles of the Global Fund? Yeah, right. We had the great benefit in, in 2002 that we could learn from almost 40 years of uh, experience in development cooperation. And, and therefore we could start fresh, if you like, with a couple of new approaches. Um, one is how we are organized as a board and at the country level. And from the beginning we pursued what we call a multi-stakeholder approach. That meant in our board you have donor governments, you have governments from implementing countries, but you have also civil societies sitting there, you have the private sector and the private foundations. Uh, because we realized that only in a kind of concerted effort can we ever hope to address big diseases like, you know, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. But that was really innovative and was going beyond the kind of UN model uh, that, you know, consists of member states. And having the private sector on the board, having the civil society on the board has really made a difference. The same happens at the country level. Uh, countries that receive funding from the Global Fund, they also have to have what we call a country coordinating mechanism, basically a round table, where again you have the government, the civil society, the private sector sitting there. They design the programs, they implement the programs, and we mobilize the resources in innovative ways, but we are also trying to kind of spend the resources in innovative ways at the country level. And how, for example, do you ensure an efficient money spending in the recipient countries? Right. It's very much a kind of private sector inspired model um, because we, we regard that as an investment. And that means every country is asked to design their programs. We are not designing the programs, you know, that has to happen at the country level. They know best what they need for the people in the country. When we approve the proposal, we basically enter into a contract. We say, okay, so you want to achieve certain things. There are clear targets, there are clear indicators. We sign a legally binding contract. And your role is to achieve the targets, our role is to provide the finance. And we will, you know, have control mechanisms in between. In every country where we operate, we have private sector accounting firms who basically look at the financial transactions, they do spot checks, they make sure that, you know, what is in the contract is really followed. And we implement what we call performance-based funding. That means our disbursements flow only if certain results are achieved. Um, but that works very well. That works to the advantage of both the implementer in the country and the Global Fund because we have an accountability mechanism that is a reinsurance for our investors who provide us with resources and we achieve results. And the results have been quite impressive. I mentioned, you know, the percentage numbers, but let me say we're currently supporting about uh, 6.1 million people every day on AIDS treatment. That prevents millions of deaths. We have helped to distribute more than 400 million bed nets to protect from malaria. So this is large scale investment, if you like, and only that can really have an impact on these diseases. Mm. So you mentioned that you have a high outcome and uh, the efficiency is there. So how can you guarantee the income and the funding of the organizations, especially after mm. the financial crisis? I suppose governments are the major source of, for funding for the Global Fund. Yeah. So after the uh, global financial crisis, how has the situation changed? And mm. can other donors, for example, private donors, uh, balance out the situation? Yeah. Mobilizing resources is always a question of confidence. You, you can only hope to mobilize resources if those who can provide the money have confidence in what you're doing and in the results that you're achieving. Unfortunately, that's, that's the case. Therefore, our income has not gone down after the financial crisis 2008, 2009. 
um, let's say the increase has not been as steep as it has been before. Um, but, you know, governments have continued to provide uh, very significant resources. We had a big donor conference end of last year, actually, in, in Washington, D.C., hosted by the U.S. government. It raised $12 billion for the next three years, and that was 20 percent more than what we had in the period before. So we can't say because of the financial crisis, you know, there are no resources. It's probably more difficult. But in a sense, it's also an advantage for the Global Fund because you know, the, the donors increase their scrutiny, if you like. They, they, they want even more to know where the money is going. They say, we have to present that to our taxpayers. The budgets are tight, so we need to be able to demonstrate what is happening with the money, and that's exactly what we can provide. So I think, therefore, we, we have not been affected in the sense that, you know, donor governments have decreased their resources, but you're also right. Uh, we complement that by resources from the private sector. We have major foundations, obviously, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a major uh, funder, but we also have a lot of corporations. We have uh, a number of high net worth individuals who see the Global Fund as an investment vehicle, you know, for social impact investment. Um, they can also target their investment in countries um, where they have particular interest, business interest, or where they are based. We have a number of um, business people and foundations from Asia, for example, who through us invest in their countries, in the health of, of the people, because in the end, uh, a thriving economy needs also healthy people. Dr. Christoph Benn from the Global Fund, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for watching. Do make sure to keep clicking back on the Tukas Copy TV website for latest updates and exclusive interviews. Have a good day and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.